Hi everyone, hey, thanks so much for joining me today. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying the Christmas season. And for the Christmas season, I'm doing a series called Missing Peace. I think it's very easy in these times that we're going through, and even this time of year with the extra stresses and strains of the holiday season, to feel anything but peace. But didn't that angel say, peace on earth, goodwill to everybody, and where is that peace? Well, last week we started the series by asking the question, is peace even possible? If you didn't get a chance to watch that, you might want to go back to the Facebook page or the YouTube channel and check that out because I, I heard some great feedback from people that it was very helpful. But today we're going to take it, take it right here home where we live. We're going to talk about our relationships. Is peace possible in our marriages, in our families, in our work situation, with our friendships? Is it really possible to, to have that sense of peace that God says that he promises? Well, we're going to take a look at that today in a message that I call help these people are getting on my nerves um, to start off let me ask you how many of you know someone that's a bit difficult to love right and don't point to them you can just raise your hand if I indicate. <laughs> okay. um, you know i think in the last 633 days i looked it up I had to google it but that's the number of days since the covid pandemic you know has been declared by the cdc to be what it is um, I think that 2020 produced more of those kinds of people that are hard to love. And I think 2021 has continued, you know, um, approaching the Christmas season and some of you are going to see family and you're going to see friends that you haven't seen for a long time, especially perhaps family. And, you know, a regular, a regular Christmas season is crazy enough um, and maybe even tense enough at times, you know, with our, with our complicated family dynamics. And I think just about all of us have some kind of complications in our family dynamics, but Add the, add the um, you know, just those, the, the regular stuff that goes on, add COVID, uh, then add, you know, what, five billion masks. <laughs> That's how many masks that we, you know, imagine that, five billion masks, literally. A vaccine that has raised so many issues and been so debated, um, the political unrest, you know, um, I mean, the social and political unrest is probably the greatest I've ever seen in my lifetime. Um, maybe it'll get worse. I'll probably say that another time in my life. But, um, and I don't know, I, I just, aren't you just sick of COVID? I'm glad you're not sick with COVID, but aren't you just sick of COVID? And now we have, a, you know, on the, just the cherry on top, we've got a brand new variant. Where do they come up with the names of these variants, you know? The Delta variant. I like the Delta. We're right the Delta. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind the airlines being named Delta, right? But a variant, and we got a disease now named Delta. We were in the Delta area, you know? And then my, I heard, my a friend of mine was talking about his new Chevy Omicron. Which, um, wait, and wait a second, Omicron, that's, um, no, that's, a, that's, that's the villain that the Transformers are getting, right? No, that's Megatron. Okay, so I'm getting, I'm getting mixed up. No, wait, that's the convention. I have to get, that's the convention they go to, and everybody dresses up as a superhero. No, no, that's, um, that's Comic-Con. Okay, Omicron's the, that's the variant, right? Okay, so that's the variant. We've got a brand new one. Uh, sounds like a superhero or a model of hybrid car. Um, but seriously, all of this going on in our lives, you know, I, I was reading some studies and I, I read a lot of what counselors say, psychologists or whatever, both Christians and not, and just to kind of see what they say. And, you know, it's interesting. Experts say that it may be decades before we really see the impact that all of this has made on us physically. Yeah, but also emotionally, uh, and relationally. Um, I've mentioned it before, but the divorce rate in, in 2020 was the highest it ever has been. Um, why? Because of all of the stress. And certainly uh, this relational health element to it. Um, and uh, according to counselors, frankly, just bottom line, things are not going well. And, um, and of course, last year, um, this, this created a perfect scenario for tension. You think about it. I mean, you shut the world down. And then, you know, for a significant period of time, then you end up spending enormous amounts of time with a select and perhaps small group of people. And then other people you never see. Um, there are people probably in your life, and I have some as well, that I used to see on a weekly basis that I have not seen since the shutdown in, what, March of 2020. Um, and so it's crazy how this can affect us. P poor parents became homeschoolers overnight, whether they felt qualified or wanted to or not. Um, you know, suddenly they're homeschoolers. And, um, and, and all, of course, all the school problems, and some of you may have followed that, I, you know, with having grandkids, uh, you know, they're small enough that they're not in school yet, my kids are out, but, but just feeling so much for parents and all the stuff that they had to go through. Um, 
just kind of disappointment after disappointment. And, and uh, just that feeling of loss, uh, uh, the feeling of grief. I heard a, a, you know, a, a famous pastor say, he goes, I think when we get you know, where things are somewhat normal, we're all going to sense have this, this sense of grief. The sense of loss, like wow, we missed up, on, messed out on, uh, missed out on so much. Um, we also added to our list of topics that we're not allowed to discuss. So, what are the, the two, the two normal, the two regulars? We're not supposed to discuss. We're saying this in church: religion <laughs> and politics, right? So we've added one now. It's a trilogy now: religion, politics, and science. Nah, we're, we're not allowed to talk about that. Um, you know, it's funny. At the beginning of 2020, I, I probably the case for you. Beginning of 2020, I didn't know any experts in science. <laughs> None. I mean, I, I went to my doctor and stuff like that, but didn't know any experts. Now I know hundreds of them, um, and it's you know kind of crazy. It, you know, it's it's hard because you know a person. I say expert, I'm using that loosely because what basically that means is they watch three YouTube videos, listen to a podcast, and boom, they're experts. You know? So that's that's kind of a hard one, but um, it wasn't enough for us to fight about masks and vaccines, but you know, again, we had to mix you know, politics all into it. Um, you know, it was one of those things too where got, religion got thrown in. I lacked faith if I got a vaccine, and I was being cruel and unkind if I did. You know, we, you know back and forth, it was, it was crazy, you know, all of the things, and it still goes on. I mean, I, I have met some of the pe some of the meanest people on both sides, so I'm not trying to defend either way. I think you have to pray about that and see what God wants you to do with that whole thing. But, I mean, on both sides, I mean, people got really nasty and really mean. And I, looking at all of this that we're living through, I think we are entering or have, have entered and maybe have been in quite a long time, the age of perpetual offense. Yeah. Right? I, where, where, I mean, people so quickly get angry. People so quickly are quick to judge and are quick to point out errors. And if you don't agree with them, you're stupid or whatever. Um, uh, or, or you're some kind of phobic, you know, if you don't agree exactly with them. And they're so quick, you know, you hurt me, you wronged me, I'm going to cancel you. And there's another one, cancel, cancel. You remember, I, I remember cancel, just make it cancel your subscription, right? You cancel the paper because you're reading it online. No, now it's like a big deal. Cancel culture, here we are. Um, but here's what I wanted to say. As we talk about living a life of peace with people, is that those who are on a continual search to be offended <laughs> will always find what they're looking for. Yeah. You know right? I mean, sometimes you can lose something and you'll be really looking for it. But I'll tell you, if you look for an offense... You don't have to usually look very far and you will find it. If you're always looking for hurt, always looking to be offended, always looking to be wronged or to be angry, um, man, that's easy. You'll always find what you're looking for in that. I, I, um, and then here's the challenge. The challenge is right below that. There, there is, there's absolutely no win in, in, in whatsoever in living a life offended. There's just no benefit to it. Um, I'm not saying you have to agree with everybody, but just living offended. I've never met anybody who said, you know, now that I'm ticked off all the time, I am so much more productive, I'm getting so much more done, I'm so much more successful in life, because I'm ticked off all the time. I've never met anybody who, who has said that. Um, the quality of my life is so great because I'm just so angry. I, that's not the case. I just don't find that anywhere. And the truth is that people, I think, are hurting right now. Some of you sitting here, you're hurting right now, and, and, and we're on the edge you know, and, um, and it's easy for us to, to quickly get hurt, to quickly get offended. Um, some of you, now, and I don't want to, uh, you know, just kind of throw off the, the last couple of years as nothing, because some of you have experienced significant hurt. Um, I, I've talked to people who have really gone through a lot of real agony, I mean, and, and loss, and even personal loss, and so forth. And uh, people here at the church who have lost a number of people in the last, you know, year and a half or so. Um, and so the truth is, I mean, people are hurting. So as, again, we may see family members that we haven't seen for a long time coming up here in a couple weeks, and, you know, maybe there's some that you're, frankly, dreading to see. Um, and I don't mean you're trying to be cruel or mean, but it's just like, ugh, they're just so high maintenance, or they're just so combative, or they're so something, um, maybe so addicted, whatever it might be. And you're saying, oh my goodness, I really am not looking forward to seeing them. I want us to see what does God say about us living in peace with people. The first thing I want to mention, which is you know point number one, and uh, is this: is that being offended is inevitable. I didn't have to tell you that, but living offended is a choice. That's a choice. 
And if we're Christ followers, if God has called us to follow him, uh, we are called to choose very wisely when it comes to that. Here we are in part two of this Missing Peace series, but uh, the title of my message was really inspired by my oldest daughter when she was very, very young. Um, I don't even know, uh, maybe she was three, but we were at a family event, we were, it was a Christmas event, it was down at my grandmother's in Salinas, and we were all there, and there was just a lot of people, and uh, my grandmother hosted tons of people all the time, but there was family and everything, and, and I guess it was more than, than Janelle could handle, because she went and sat in the back porch, and, back, uh, porch, and my uncle come over, came over and said, Janelle, what's up? What's the matter? And she said, these people are getting on my nerves. <laughs> Which is funny to us because, again, I don't even know if she was three, and uh, people are getting on her nerves. It's kind of like, wow, baby, you've got a long life ahead of you. Um, and she's very much a people person, so it, it, it all worked out. But, so she was the inspiration to this, this message, <laughs> this title, you know, these people are getting on my nerves. And, uh, um, and it's funny in that context, but frankly, <laughs> day to day, it's not quite as funny, huh? When you're out driving and when you're at work and when you're having to deal with the neighbors and all of that. It's not, not quite as funny. But... Uh, but again, we're to live at peace. Jesus calls us to do that. Um, it's uh, this relational peace. Jesus is, we saw this last week, Jesus is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And no matter if it's a family member, it's a spouse, it's a friend, it's, it's a co-worker. You know, our scripture today that we're going to look at, it's a tough one. Um, it's easy to read, but it's, it's kind of tough to, to live out. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at, at Romans. We're going to look at some other scriptures too, but we're really going to just hone in on, on what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12. This is, I mean, just from the start, it's tough. Because he says, and this is very counterintuitive, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You've read that, perhaps some of you, if you've been in church. But, I mean, as Christ followers, okay, then he goes on, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Okay, we can do that. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Now, we kind of look at that as economic status, but you may have people, let's just say, be willing to be with those people that you really aren't comfortable with. And that can mean a lot of things. I'm not just talking about economic status, but it's just like you feel uncomfortable with that. Um, anyone, anyway, uh, do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. But then the next verse is really our key verse. And this is the one we're going to focus on especially. But it says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We do all we can to live at peace with everyone. Everyone. The, the part two right off when Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Ignore those who persecute you? I, I can do that, right? You know, avoid them, whatever. But he says, bless them. Actively bless them. And that includes the people who are mean to you, the people who blow up at you, the people who insult you, the people who cut you off on the freeway, the people who disagree with you and disagree with you in a mean way. You know, not in a nice, let's discuss our different, you know, opinions kind of way. Bless them. Here, here's what the word bless means. And I think I may have given you a place where if you want to jot this down. But the word bless, it comes from a Greek word, eulogeo. Now, you may re recognize the word eulogy in that. That's, that's where they get, they get the word. But you take this apart, and you've got the, the you part, which means well or good, and the word logos, which that's, you know, this is the legato, that's a Greek, or the, the verb form of it, it means to speak, you know, uh, it means a word or to speak. So, great, okay, to so speak well. Put that together, and, and the, the idea of you legato is this. It is to speak well of, has the idea to wish the best blessing for someone. Now remember who we're talking about. Bless those who persecute you. You know, wait, I mean, for somebody who is rude to you, who betrays you, bless those who persecute you. Now is this, this is tough, right? This is hard to hear. I mean, it's easy for me to wish the best for you if I like you. I wish the best for all of you. But to wish the best for, for people who are, are harsh to me, who are mean to me, or are hateful to me, I think it's easy to bless someone who's a blessing. I think it's easy to be gracious to people who are gracious. 
I think it's, you know, easy to be generous to people who are generous. It's difficult when somebody offends you, somebody is harsh, somebody, is, somebody belittles you, um, somebody leaves you out, somebody hurts you, somebody betrays you. Um, and, and, and granted, I would probably say you probably are as terrible as I am. <laughs> but there is something, I don't know, when somebody disrespects me or you know, somebody I really don't trust, something they've done to, to really lose my trust, that there's a very sick kind of part of me that, um, and maybe you can relate to this, but if, if something bad happens, I'm kind of a little bit happy. I'll never forget driving down to church, church on Sunday morning, right? When I go worship God. Driving on Highway 4, and I'm driving in, in the lane, and this guy comes barely behind me. I can see him in my rear view mirror. I mean, he's doing a, you know, a thousand miles an hour. Going, I mean, and he's honking. I can hear his honk horn. And he's coming up on the back of me, and he's got his hand out. And he's not saying you're number one. He's basically <laughs> flipping off the world. And I thought, wow, this guy's having a bad morning. Well, you know, I, I pulled over and, you know, he went zooming by. And he's still honking, flipping the world off. And, and I'm like, wow, um, what a jerk, you know. Little ways, I get, I get knocked by Talone Tree. Yeah. And he gets pulled over. Oh, yeah. so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> See? You're, you're sick like me, too. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it was everything I could to do, you know, not roll down the window. <laughs> Give a little beep beep and a little wave. I mean, right, there is, there's just a sickness in me. This, <laughs> he, he didn't really do that much to me. I mean, I just changed lanes Sunday morning, you know, I made fours, bacon, you know, it's good. But there's something about me that just likes that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, we think, what an idiot. And there's the CHP's got him. But, uh, but Paul gives us a very, a very direct command here. In the Greek language, this command is a present imperative. You're going, big deal. Uh, except you're English, of Europe. Um, in the Greek language, the, the present imperative means we're commanded to do something. Okay, this is an imperative. You're supposed to do it. But a present imperative has the idea that you continually do it. So what, what we're commanded is to keep on doing. It's not one shot deal. It's not like this person's being mean to you, so just go, yeah, bless you, whatever. And then, and, and then you're out of there. He, he says it's... He's saying, here's what he's saying, being a continual blessing to those who are a continual problem. Great. Um, some of you have pictures of people going through your mind right now, right? Um, Paul is saying that. And, and I think I can be, see, I can be a blessing who's a, to somebody who's a problem, you know, occasionally. Or, but wow, to be a continual blessing to someone who is a continual burden. To, to, to say gracious, loving things to someone who continually says unkind things to me. That doesn't even seem to make sense. It's my nature to just snap and retaliate. I, I don't want to bless someone who's hurt me. But Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gives us this imperative. That as followers of Christ, we are to continually be a blessing to those who are in continual pain. You know, how do we do that? Um, now, let me just say right off, it's completely impossible for us to do this in our own nature. You know, this is not a willpower thing. Um, Paul knows when he wrote it, God knows when he gave it to us, that this was not the norm. You know, uh, again, the norm would be at our very best, just avoid those people. We tell our kids that, just avoid those. Those people that are being, that, just avoid them. And here, God's telling us no. And I think we have to understand it because uh, as we look at the context of Romans 12, so we really see that. If you look at the first verse of Romans 12, um, it's going to set up the context of how do we love people that are so difficult? And here's what Paul starts off by saying in, in Romans 12 when he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Now we have to pause there. How merciful has God been to you and me? Um, how much has he forgiven that I didn't deserve his forgiveness? How much has he blessed me beyond what I have ever earned or ever should have gotten? He says, in view of God's good news to us, then Paul says, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And, and, and I'll come back to that. But in view of who God is, in view of what he has done, we are to, to look we are to look at our lives, we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, loving people as we've been loved is a spiritual act of worship, not how they love us. It's an act of worship for us when we will treat people as God treats us. 
We're to reflect that love. Were they nice to God? Were they nice to Jesus? No, no but what was he? Loving to the very end and continues to be. For God so loved the world. And so for us, we're reflecting that. Um, worship isn't just, we talk about some songs, worship songs. Worship isn't just the songs we sing, it's the life that we live. So how do we do this? How do we become a living sacrifice? Now that sounds contradictory, you know, a living sacrifice. Then I think, when I think of sacrifices, I think of dead sacrifices. You know, back in the Old Testament when they were offered, you know, sacrifices, and I think of these animal sacrifices. I mean, if they had decided, Okay, living sacrifice. If they had decided to ask the animals and if they could, you know, do the little doctor, do the little thing, and say, okay, we're looking for volunteers. Sheep? Anybody? Anybody? They're not going to go, ah, sure, slip my throat. I got you. You know, none of them. There's no volunteering. But the Lamb of God, Jesus, lived constantly knowing he was going to die, was willing to die, a living sacrifice. In fact, he said, no one takes my life. I give it. I give it freely. So nobody's, this wasn't, you know, this was him living as a sacrifice. How do we love others? We lay down that natural response that we have, and that's a tough one. We lay that down. We have to lay down our own, situ you know, uh, selfish desires, and then we, 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 we die, die to ourselves. Die to that. Um, so that we can love others. That's what Paul was talking about in Galatians 2.20. But he said, I have been I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. I'm not taking it, saying physically you stop living, but he said, my will, my purpose, my direction, my, my, my perspective in life. I've been crucified with him, so everything changes. I've become a new creation, but Christ lives in me. How do we love people? How? We, I mean, we have to love them beyond ourselves. See, I don't have it in myself to not want to fight back to not want to retaliate. But if, I, but if I died to myself, Christ is living inside of me. And that's the truth of it, accepting Christ. Being a Christian isn't just adhering to a set of beliefs. You know that. Those of you who are Christ followers, you know it's not just saying, okay, I believe that, 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 check here. Okay, good, I'm all in. It's a relationship. That's why we say it's not a religion. It's a relationship because it is a relationship. It's a relationship personally with a God we can know and who can in a spirit who indwells us. Paul goes on to say in verse 16, he goes, he says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not, don't be proud, don't be conceited. Now let me let me tell you what this actually means. And I'm, I'm you know, look, I look, try to look up the scriptures. I have in the uh, uh, Greek and the Hebrew. I was taught this, and so I I, I looked at this and very intently. And I, I just want to let me read literally how this should be translated. Do not be proud and do not be conceited. <laughs> See, that grad school helped really pay off, didn't it? Here it is. It's just, it is what it is, what it is. I know some of like, ooh, it's nice to get those little nuances. You don't get any. Do, do not be proud and do not be conceited. There seems to be so many proud and conceited people lately. And I know I struggle with my own pride because I think I got the answers. But oh my goodness, it just seems like that character flaw has just come to the surface in so many ways. You know, um, I have never known so many right people in all of my life. I mean, wow, doggone it, I'm right, I've watched four YouTube videos, listened to three biased podcasts, and I've got a friend who knows somebody who sent them an email that, you know, I mean, and it's like, and then we're right. I, I have no idea, you know. And the thing is, I'm right and everybody's stupid. See, that's, I think that's what Jesus had a big, great deal of problems with, because we never see that. He was living in the Roman Empire with Roman oppression. And you never see him going, you're going to stand up and throw, no, no. In fact, here's the thing. Jesus didn't call us. He didn't say, here's my mission for you. You've got to be right. I think he wants us to believe the right things. I, I'm not trying to minimize that. Jesus told us to be what? Loving, loving. Jesus didn't call us to be right. He didn't tell us you have to be right. We're not going to be right all the time. He knew that. But Jesus told us to be loving. He didn't say the world was going to know about me because of how correct you are. Because you have your theology all exactly straight down. He said they would know you and they would be asking questions and they would say, wow, those must be a Christ follower by how loving they are. 
I mean, I, I know conservative people, I, I, I'm conservative, but I know conservative people who just they could believe that somebody liberal could possibly love Jesus. And then I have really good friends who are liberal, and they would say, you know, wow, those conservative Christians, they're so, they can't possibly be Christians, they're so mean, and they're hateful, and just hate mongers, and you know, how they could possibly... And the truth of that is, is that, you know, we see this, and we've got this all mixed up. If we live in, in, in either one of those extremes, you know, I'd just say, hey, please, picture for just a moment, visualize somebody else born in a different part of the world, a different life situation, different parent situation, different family dynamic, different skin color, whatever, whatever you need, all of that different culture. And because of that perspective, see, we're, we're, we think so much like Americans. <laughs> and, and if we think like Jesus, think of the people and what they're going through and how they could love Jesus and maybe, and maybe not even believe it, you know, everything exactly like we do. There's fundamentals. There's a foundation. The gospel is the gospel. You know, God's word is God's word. But there's so many times that people fight over, you know, in the name of Jesus, fighting over even all this stuff with the COVID. And it's, and it's not. I'm trying to do this, and I don't do it very well, but I'm really trying to do this, and this is why I put this here. It says, when people talk, don't listen to respond. Listen to understand. Don't listen to correct. Don't listen to, you know, jump in and give, you know, tell them what really is valuable. Listen to understand. Listen to love. Um, I do not like getting on social media threads and sometimes when something gets brought up. Um, I have done this on a couple of occasions and I've usually always, always, always regretted it. I've had a guy that well, we were kind of sparring back and forth on and, uh, this whole issue with uh, right to life and all of that kinds of stuff, the abortion issues and all that. So we were talking back and forth. And, and as I, the more I talked, the more he seemed to calm down because he was really, really hateful. At the beginning, and seemed to calm down. And, and at one point where it kind of closed, he said, you seem really sincere. And I said, yeah. I said, I am. Because I used a term that I heard other people, well, I'll just tell you, I, I, I used the term transgender. I have friends who said that, who are, are transgender. And I used that, and he said, you're using it wrong. That's an offensive way to use that. So I said, tell me, what's, what's the way to say that? And he wrote me, you seem like you really are sincere. You really care. I go, I do. And I thought, finally. You know, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was glad to get off the thread. But I really, I really wanted to you know where he was coming from and what he was struggling with and what his life was like because he obviously has some real bitterness. I mean, he described himself as a pagan. What do you believe? I'm a pagan. I thought, there's my target right there. You know, I want to share Jesus with that guy if I can. And I told him, you know, I said, hey, I know you don't believe in God, but I said he loves you anyway, whether you believe in him or not. So he's, you can't stop him. But uh, he just kind of LOL'd me. It's, you know. But so many times when we were listening to people, whether it be at work, whether it be at school, whether it be wherever, at home, I home, I probably am the most guilty of that. But man, listen, listen to not to correct, not to respond, not to you know really tell what's going on, but to, to really understand. If we can't understand another perspective or impact, you know what? Our ministry, our impact is always going to be smaller. It's always going to be limited. Um, look, we'll all face conflict. You already have. You already will, and you will. Differences of perspective. Oh my goodness, we're going to get a lot of those. Um, where we don't understand it, because our our brains are kind of wired to protect ourselves. What happens is is that we, we kind of create a story to explain our situation or theirs. So, if someone is unkind, impatient, or has a, a different opinion about something, you know, we make up a story about them, kind of fill in the gaps. Um, now, we do this all the time. Now, if, if it's us, for example, if I'm short with you, or I'm late, or I, you know, treat you mean, or I say harsh words or whatever, see, I judge myself by my intentions. Um, I tend to judge you by your actions and your actions alone. So if I come off mean and impatient, so I create this scenario where, look, you should understand, I, you should under, realize that my intentions were good and so forth. But if you come off harsh and you come off and you're, you know, seem flippant or whatever, or sarcastic, then, wow, you're a jerk. And that's the, that's the scenario we create, the kind of the story we tell. And, and, and the reason why I bring this up is because all of this having peace with people, it's not just a relational thing. Do you know, the devil wants us to be, and he wants to do everything he can for us to tell the wrong story about people. Why? He's the accuser of the brethren. And if he can enlist us, 
to be that, to accuse people, oh my goodness, this job's you know much, much easier. He doesn't have to accuse the brethren if we as brothers and sisters in Christ are you know bashing each other and accusing each other and judging you. Well, wow, that makes it so much easier for him. So if someone does something to hurt you or offend you, you know, what does he want us to do? Well, I can't trust her. In fact, you can't trust anybody these days, can you? Um, you know, he's only looking out for himself. She's only looking out for himself. People are always going to let you down. You know? um, they're never going to be able to be trusted. You know, your mom's always, my mom's always, dear dad, but, right? You come up with all these lists of things. The devil wants our stories and what we do. And, you know, we've created them because parents, right? We do this with our kids. They're late coming home and we've got them sprawled out in the middle of the freeway, you know. Um, what is it? That's a, you know, a story we create. The devil wants us to uh, create accusatory stories about those that God loves and Jesus died for. But what does accusations do? I, this isn't, you know, uh, a marriage lesson per se. Accusations, they, they erode marriages. I've seen it. And some of you are seeing that right now, and maybe in your own life, in your own marriage, in your own situation, friendship. Uh, accusations split friendships. Accusations divide churches. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, he says, let all you do be done in love. Ephesians 4, 2 also says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Oh, we all could use that. Make allowance for each other's fault because of your love. They're not going to know that we're Christians by how correct we are. I have a tendency, I want to be correct. I want to be right. But that's not how the world's going to know. The world's going to know Jesus by the way we love. Yes, you know what? It's inevitable. We're going to be offended, and we're going to offend. It's inevitable. Uh, you know, but living offended, as we mentioned, is a choice. Is a choice. The third thing I want to mention is this. Just something for us to remind ourselves over and over. Your life, my life, it's too short. And God's purpose for you is too great to, to be offended by something you know, small and insignificant. Uh, our life is like a mist. We do, we see that again, us parents, grandparents, we, right? we see that through our kids, we go, man, where did the time go? You know, we see Jason's kid, where, where did the time go? How come they're tall as me? That's, you know, they're supposed to be, you know, no, they're all grown up. God knows this. I mean, God's saying this about his kids. My, how you grow, you grow so fast. Look, it's like a mist. It's gone. God knows that. And it's so brief. That God's purpose for us that he has for us is an eternally significant purpose and that's why he doesn't want us to get you know, bogged down by offenses. Imagine if Jesus got offended easily. You know? Matthew, were you paying attention to what I was just saying? I said, blessed are the... You weren't even writing it down. Come on, come on. Pay attention here. I'm, I'm preaching here. And uh, how are you going to get those three chapters? Well, anyway, I, you know, um, and of course, you know, Thomas, I doubt he's even paying attention. <laughs> you know, he's not writing anything. He does. I mean, I open blind eyes. I raise the dead. Not even, come on, I raise the dead. Do I get to preach? I help 10 lepers. Do they come back and thank me? Well, this one guy, but am I even appreciated, right? Can you imagine? <laughs> Being offended is inevitable, but living offended is really a choice. Proverbs 19.11 is so powerful. It says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to do what? Overlook an offense. Wouldn't it be amazing if in response to God's love that we just got better at look, overlooking offenses? And what does that mean to overlook an offense? Because, look, it's not talking about that there shouldn't be justice. It doesn't mean that we should, you know, people should, don't deserve punishment and so forth. It doesn't mean like when you're raising your kids, well, let's just overlook an offense. I know, they, you know. No, here's what it means. It, it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't mean that you're pretending it didn't happen. That's not, that's not it. When we're talking about interpersonal, uh, you know, offenses like that, overlooking an offense is a conscious decision to let it go. Now, that's a personal thing. That's a conscious decision on my part. You may be in a situation, you may be a boss at work where there are consequences, you may be a parent where there are consequences to a child's offense. That's, that's not what he's even talking about. 
It's essentially real-time forgiveness. It's forgiveness in the moment. The word overlook in the Hebrew uh, language is the word afore, which means to pass over. It means to pass through. It actually means to get up above. You know? Um, you ever have heard somebody say, oh, get over it. God's saying this to us in kind of another kind of way. Get over it. Let them play down there. Let them insult you down here. Let them you know, offend you down there. Look, you're my family. Get over it. See that perspective from my standpoint. You know, you know. Let them, let them do it. And, and look, you, you know, you have difficulty. You have, right? Your mother-in-law corrects your kids again. That's a tough one. You know, hey, I'm over it. Somebody's a, somebody's passive aggressive to you. Okay, I'm over it. Your spouse makes fun of you. You know, in front of a bunch of people, and it's embarrassing. It, you know, you get, you get over it. Um, somebody's a jerk to you at work. You get over it. When we say get over it, we usually mean just get through it and forget it. But God wants us to see it from his standpoint. And he doesn't make us do that alone. The third thing as a part of this is what does it mean to overlook is that love doesn't seek to win the arguments. Really, love seeks to, to, to protect that relationship. And that's the point there. Um, I never try to come off like I have it all together, but I've had people make comments over the years, and maybe those of you who know this long enough, maybe I'll make less of them. But I've had people talk about Cindy and I, like we got this perfect house and perfect marriage and perfect everything and perfect, perfect, you know, family and all of that stuff. And, um, and you know, though, I have to tell you, I'll just be honest, Cindy and I do on occasion have discussions, <laughs> which is preacher language for intense arguments. Um, you know, and, and during the pandemic, I mean, the shutdown, the lockdown, we had some doozies. They, you know, um, we just we disagreed on philosophies of parenting. Um, in fact, we were disagreeing about parenting before we were even married. It was kind of crazy <laughs> because, you know, uh, it was really, you know, uh, sometimes I was too strict in some areas, and sometimes you know, Cindy was too strict in others. Or at least that was the perspective back and forth. You know. Um, and, and we go, we can go back and forth, and some of you know that feeling. But here's the thing: in, in the process, in the effort to be right, sometimes we forget to be loving. That's why God says to speak the truth in love. But separating either one of those really creates problems, because if you don't tell the truth, you're not being loving. And if you tell the truth without love, it's just harsh, and they won't be able to hear it and accept it. You over, overlook offenses. See, so got the perspective. You get on top of it and overlook it. And uh, I love the thing that Cindy sometimes says. I don't think it's a Bible verse, but she'll say to us sometimes, you need to upgrade your words. <laughs> when I get all frazzled, you know, about something that's really not that significant, she does this to the kids, and she, you know, or she'll talk to us, she'll say, that person needs to upgrade their worries. And you know, wow. Um, and some of you, the worries you have are really difficult and, and serious. But I think so much of what we let consume us and our offenses are really, you know, really need an upgrade. But back to Romans 12, 18, as we, you know, pull this together. That key verse, we have, you know, we, we all have been offended, but it says, as if it is possible. If it is possible. As far as it depends on you, which means you can't control what everybody's doing. And everybody, you know, you really can't. You, 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 but whatever you can do, you know, Whatever you can do, live at peace with everyone. And that means the person that you're not talking to right now. Um, as much as you can, you're going to do what's right. That person who's rude to you. Some of you may have family members you're not talking to. Um, don't let an offense come between you and your relationship with God, that peace. You know. Now, what I know is that some of you probably have tensions and you have conflicts and you have fallouts with people and it's... And for, for some people, it's too late because they're gone. They've passed away. Um, it's too late to make peace. God would not want you to beat yourself up. God would want you to learn from it, but God would want, not want you to beat yourself up. But when we have people who are still reachable, and by that I mean literally, physically, we can talk to them. Um, God wants us to take those opportunities to restore, to store what it once was or make it even better than it once was. Uh, but that you can be more at peace than you are now with people. There are people that that's the case. So you still have a chance with somebody. You still have that chance. If you've got a you know, fractured marriage, you still, that can be healed. And you say, are you kidding my problems? Um, it would take a miracle. God can do that. 
That's God's specialty. He does miracles. Um, and I know all of this is a tough assignment. Um, but it's too, also too tough to do on your own. You need help from the one who is peace, who is the prince of peace and brings relational peace. Um, and then he yeah, but you're not being nice. As much as is in with you. You know, they didn't apologize. Well, hey, it, it takes two to reconcile. Let me just say, yes, it, it does take two to reconcile, but it only takes one to forgive. You can do your part. We can be loving even when they aren't. As far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on me, we're going to live at peace with everyone. I promise you, um, people will let you down. I will let you down. And even I have let down. Um, and so, uh, as, as followers of Christ, we have God's Spirit living in us, in our hearts. And really, as I go, it's really, it's my prayer that to someone that could just, that you might know, it just needs that for you to be the one to reach out. You know, for you to be the one to say, hey, this is silly, or this is ridiculous, it's been years. It's just reconnect in that way. That's my prayer, just to be able to say, God, help me to live at peace. Help me to show your love. Help me to have a love that comes from you, you know, and, and really make a difference. Love me with the love that you have for me. If you have, you know, any kind of relationship that's really seriously wounded, broken trust, whatever, um, broken friendship, broken relationship. Some of you maybe have talked to kids or grandkids in a, a very long time. Um, it's time. Really, it's time. As much as it is within you. Now, you may try to reach out and they may say, forget you. As much as within you. So I just ask, how, how now are you going to live this out? I mentioned earlier, I, if we had time to talk, I might ask, hey, how are things going with you and God? And maybe you'd point out to some good stuff you did or, or some bad stuff you haven't done. <laughs> and... Um, but there's still not that genuine peace inside. The good news is that you're not here by accident. All of us are not here by accident. Um, it's by the grace of God who loves you so much that uh, he did something for you that could, you couldn't do for yourself and he paid for all of our sin because he loves you. God sent his son, born of a virgin. We're celebrating that this time of year. Perfect in every way, the lamb of God, the living sacrifice, the one who said, I lay down my life. Jesus gave his life on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. If we believe him, no matter what, no matter what you've done, it's so great. God doesn't hold an offense. He pays for them. Let's bow together. As we close, God hears your prayers. He hears your hearts. He knows, he knows those faces that you have been picturing in your mind as we've been talking about this peace with others about those people who are getting on your nerves, or maybe got on your nerves and got on your last name. But if you're lacking peace with him, I want you to know he forgives it. He heals your heart. He mends brokenness. And maybe if you're, if you're here today, or maybe you're watching, um, if you recognize today that you need God's grace and peace, you can call on him to save you today. In fact, I'm, I'm just going to pray a prayer similar to what I prayed when I expressed that to God. It's a, it's a step of faith. It's a decision you make in your heart. But um, praying to Him and expressing it to God is a wonderful way to take that step of faith. So you can just pray, just pray something like this. Just say, Dear God, today I want to be at peace with you. I believe you sent your Son Jesus to die, be buried, and rise again so that I can be in your family and have true and lasting peace. I ask you to come into my life, change me, make me new. I give you my life today. Thank you for forgiving my sin and for giving me eternal life. Now fill me with your spirit so I can follow you and live at peace with the people in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord, as we close today, I pray that you would be with those who have, um, wow, maybe a hard phone call to make, a hard visit. 
or even as relatives come into town, and a hard discussion. But I, Lord, I just pray you would help us to live this, that as much as we can, that we would live peace with everyone. Lord, give us the strength, give us your strength, give us your spirit to help us to do what Paul said, to bless those who persecute us. And Lord, I know there are people that are seeing this message that are watching me online that are sitting right here, Father, that have somebody who is persecuting them. And maybe not physically, but verbally, just abusing them constantly, treating them disrespectfully. Everything inside of us would just want to lash out, but Lord, you've said, bless. And perhaps, Lord, as a result, people will say, wow, the way I've treated them, I wonder what's up with them. And may it be an opportunity for us us to share your love with others and the message of your truth. Thank you again for this morning and for our time to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining me today, and I want to apologize again for the sound quality or the lack of it, but I hope you were able to hear it okay, and most of all, to take away some truths that will help you in your relationships. If there is any way I can be of help to you, any encouragement I can be, if you'd like some information, I hope you'll reach out to me. Maybe you prayed that prayer at the end of my message and you'd like some information. Maybe you just have some questions about the Bible or Jesus or spirituality in general. I am so glad to be of help in any way I can. Reach out to me in any way that you feel comfortable. You might want to message me on Facebook or you could email me and then we can connect however you feel comfortable. If you'd like to talk on the phone, that would be great. Uh, if you'd rather text or email, uh, that's fine too. So however you feel comfortable, I am glad to help. In the meantime, thank you again for joining me. I hope you are doing well. I hope you're enjoying this Christmas season, even with all the craziness. You know, we already take our busy schedules and add a bunch of stuff, but I hope that you really will sense God's peace during this time. I look forward to connecting with you next week. Take care and God bless.